So we've done a couple of episodes with the Tomcat model. I think you guys are ready for the real thing. So I'm here on the Naval Academy grounds. This is an F-14A that was moved here summer of 2018 from Quonset Point, Rhode Island. And when it arrived, it actually had a full cockpit. All the equipment was in it. You can see there the round TID, the tactical information display in the back seat, my office for a number of years. And as the airplane got the lantern pod and got the precision guided capability of that, TID was replaced by a flat panel programmable TID. So this is an old school configuration. And so as a result of the airplane having a full cockpit and ejection seats, some of the local Tomcat guys were able to man up one last time. So this is me and Bill Sizemore. Size and I went through F-14 training together in the early 80s. He wound up being top stick and I was top scope. So we got to shoot our first missile together in 1983. It was pretty cool. We shot a Sidewinder at a drone off of the East Coast. And then later we were instructors together at the F-14 training squadron, VF-101, the Grim Reapers. He was the OPSO and I worked for him. And we also flew an F-16N together when he was a pilot at the Aggressor Squadron and I was the editor of Approach Magazine. So Size and I have had a lot of time in tactical jets together. So it was really poetic that we got to man up one last time before all of this stuff was taken out of the airplane. And now you can see it's just a black canopy with nothing inside. They also removed the ejection seats. Not that they worked, they weren't in operating order when it got here, but kind of cool. So let's, let's do a walk around. Let's pretend like I was describing in the last episode, we've briefed the mission, we put our flight gear on, G-suit, harness, got our helmet bag, helmet, everything we need, walked up on the flight deck, and now let's talk about how would you do a pre-flight for your average mission. All right, so first thing you do is you come up to the starboard side and you just start tapping on the panels to make sure that all of these fittings are intact. And in fact, you can see on this one, this Calfax is loose. So we'd have to get a maintainer over here with the appropriate wrench manually tighten it. And that's why the F-14 was retired when it was, because it was a bear to maintain. To access this panel, you'd have to take off or loosen every one of these Calfax, and they're not all the same size. So that was very labor intense, to put it mildly. So we're tapping on it, finding the loose Calfax, making our way aft, check this ECS, the environmental control system duct, make sure there's nothing in there. I had a couple of birds go down the ECS duct during my time in the airplane. That didn't go so well for the bird. Um, in fact, it ruined the smell of the cockpit for months afterwards. Anyway, I digress. Then you would look in the intake, make sure there's nothing that could damage the motor, FOD, foreign object damage. Look at the first stage of the turbine blades, make sure none of, are, of them are cracked. Are, or, or damaged in any way. This is a TF-30, the Pratt & Whitney engine, which is actually st obviously still in the airplane. Most of your static displays don't have an engine. The other thing we haven't talked about that's unique to the F-14 is this variable, variable geometry inlet system. So three ramps that would move based on the airspeed of the airplane. So it's supersonic airspeeds these ramps would be all the way down, so it would provide subsonic airflow at supersonic airspeeds. Now, jet designers have figured out how to do that, shape a, an inlet without having movable surfaces, so they've solved this problem, but the Tomcat had these movable, movable geometry inlets. So when you start up the engine, those ramps would cycle all the way down, and then come back up and lock. And that was the key. You had to know that they were locked because if they slip down at subsonic airspeeds, this engine would stall, if not flame out. And that's not good, especially in flight regimes like a catch-up. All right, we've talked about the drop tank 
in a previous episode, 2,000 pounds per, we got two of them, so that's 4,000 pounds of gas, very important when you're operating around the boat. Shore-based, you like to drop those things off because the airplane's a lot more maneuverable, especially if you're doing dogfighting training, ACM, air combat maneuvering, take those puppies off. But at the ship, you always had them on because you need that 4,000 pounds. Checking out all of our light covers, make sure they're not cracked or broken. Come in here, landing gear bay, make sure no leaking, make sure the gear doors are intact. As I described, first thing we would do, make sure we have the right weapons for the mission. Generally, you'd have a sidewinder on this station, which is in this case, station 8A, starboard side, 1A on the port side, 8B, so you put a sidewinder here, your short range heat seeking missile, Sparrow, your medium range radar guided missile would go here. And then later, this is where the lantern pod would go when we got that precision guided capability on the airplane. So if you look at a picture of a Tomcat with a lantern pod, you'll probably see the pod on this station. The other thing to note, just how beefy the struts are. As I described in the last episode, you're coming downhill 700 feet per minute, 54,000 pounds, 140 knots. You gotta have beefy struts, and you're doing this sortie after sortie. That's why Navy jets are heavier and can take more punishment. You can see VF-124, that's the West Coast rag. I mentioned that Size and I were in the East Coast rag, VF-101, the Grim Reapers. VF-124 was the West Coast training squadron, the gunfighters. And you can also see the bureau number. 162591. So I can look in my logbook and I was checking to see, did I ever fly this airplane? The answer was no. I flew a lot of 162 series. So the Tomcat population went from about earliest 158XXX up to 163XXX. F14A. The other thing we're doing, make sure there's no leaks, check our flaps out. As I described in the Goose episode, the Horizontal stab is gigantic. Well, the whole airplane's gigantic for a fighter, right? That's why we call it the big fighter. 67 feet long, 65 feet wide with the wings spread fully forward in 20 degree position. But this horizontal stab is as big as an A4 wing. Again, that's what gives you the good pitch authority when you're dog fighting. The other thing I mentioned is the way you can tell the difference between an A and a B and a D model of the Tomcat is the color of the exhaust nozzle. So as I mentioned, this is a TF-30, the Pratt & Whitney engine, and it has a black exhaust nozzle. So when you do cat shots with a TF-30, go through the drill that I was talking about the last show. If you haven't seen that, I recommend you watch it. So in tension, ready to go. Pilot would go to military power, cycle the controls, and then when you were ready to go, he'd go to zone two afterburner, and then he would salute. So if you look at the visual, like in the movie Top Gun. You can see that exhaust open up and the flames are shooting out, it's very dramatic. And then during the cat shot, the pilot would advance from zone two to zone five, which is full afterburning. Now, with the F-14B and D, with the GE motor, the silver exhaust nozzle, if you look at a picture, different shape, but the at a glance is the fact that it's silver. We didn't go to afterburner for cat shots. We just used main basic engine, military power. And military power with the F-110, the GE motor, was equivalent to zone two with the Pratt & Whitney TF-30, which shows you a lot about how much better the TF-30 was, I'm sorry, the, the GE F-110 was, not to mention the fact that it didn't compressor stall. And again, we've talked about that in great detail. Other thing that has to be beefy along with the struts is the tail hook. We're stopping 54,000 pounds of airplane going 140 knots in short order. So this puppy's got to be able to hold that load. Again, tail hook Navy. Look at the size of an, F, of an F-15 or an F-16's tail hook, which they use sometimes for hydraulic figures at the field. It's a piece of dental floss compared to this. All right. So let's talk about a couple of more things here during our walk around. So again, we're looking at the panels, we're looking, make sure there's nothing loose, so that we got the right weapons station 1A, 1B. 
The other thing you see on this airplane is this rail. This is a Phoenix missile rail. So the F-14 was actually built to accommodate the Phoenix missile, the long-range missile. That was developed in actually the late 50s. Now, the F-14 was introduced in 1972, but the whole concept of fleet air defense, meaning the Tomcat would go out 500,000 miles away from the aircraft carrier and then shoot this weapon, and in theory, you could shoot six Phoenix missiles at once, and the radar system could guide all six independently to take out bears and badgers and Soviet bombers at range. Fleet air defense, that's what the Tomcat did in the early days. No bombing until later. So this Phoenix rail was required so you could put a Phoenix missile on the belly station. It actually had coolant, which was a misnomer because it was heating fluid, because at altitude you didn't want the airplane to freeze or the missile to freeze. And so at the longest range, You'd shoot the uh, uh, AIM-54, it would drop off, and then go in super high altitudes. It actually looked like the space shuttle going in front of the airplane. It would climb up to 80,000 feet and then come down on the target. So it would be radar guided, go into a sort of a sample data active mode, and then it would be active in the end, and the missile had its own weapon system that was really accurate. It would come a, a alive at the end and, and guide to the target. So this was uh, another bear to maintain. It was leaky uh, and so forth. Um, the Ortiz did not like when we were carrying Phoenix missiles, um, but that's what that is. So if you see an airplane that doesn't, you know, just has a flat fuselage on the bottom, that's because they don't have the Phoenix rail. Another thing to point out, the F-14, as we know from Top Gun, had a gun. So there's the gun in the front there. And it also had a television system, what we call a TCS. And if you see a D, you have two chin bubbles. The other thing was uh, infrared search and track, IRST. Now the way you got into the airplane was on the port side. You can see the ladder right there where the American emblem is. That ladder came down and there's two stairs that would fold out. And that's how you got in the airplane. So you jump in, also pre-flight the top. We used to call it the tennis court. A whole lot of uh, real estate up there. So we have a lot of new subscribers to the channel. I, I thank you for coming aboard. Um, I, I look forward to doing a lot more of these sorts of episodes as well as some other stuff. You know, we're, we like to do a variety of things here at my channel, but thanks to our new subscribers. Tell a friend, let's keep it going. Um, if you're a first time viewer, ring the bell, give me a thumbs up, it matters a lot, and comment. I'm hoping to answer every comment we get. We're getting a lot of cool comments from gamers asking about what's the most realistic game system. We're getting a lot of uh, old school Navy guys going, hey, I worked at AIMD, or I used to fix these airplanes, or I was in VF-143. I love that stuff. And then just some people who really love the Tomcat because of uh, Top Gun, and we're all looking forward to Top Gun Maverick coming out, so we'll want to talk about those sorts of developments as well. Make everybody smarter on what they're talking about and what this airplane was all about. So thanks very much, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.